So I want to introduce our next speaker, um, who is James Perry. And I will, um, as for John Relman, I will refer you to James Perry's bio for the official word on his background and credentials. What I can tell you is the first time that I, the very, very first time that I remember seeing James was shortly after Hurricane Katrina when he was speaking at the National Fair Housing Alliance conference. James was then the CEO of the Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center. And I was blown away by all that he and his staff had faced in serving their community, as well as the depth of his commitment to that community. The emotion with which he relayed his experience about the terrible ap aftermath of Katrina moved the entire audience. I don't know that I've ever relayed this to James, but I've never forgotten that. And since that time, I've had the pleasure of serving with him on the board of the National Fair Housing Alliance for a number of years, and I've always been impressed with his, all of his contributions at, at the various meetings. He's not the most vocal when it comes to speaking during the meetings. There are some people who pipe up all the time. But when he has something to contribute, he's articulate, convincing, and to the point. And perhaps I shouldn't say this, but since James mentioned his wife in his bio, I'll be bold and mention her too. I'm also a huge admirer of Melissa Harris Perry, who you may know as the four-year host of the television show, Melissa Harris Perry, which aired weekend mornings on MSNBC. She's someone I heard speak a couple of times in person, and it, she was always electrifying. So when I heard James married her, the yenta inside of me was tickled pink. Both in their own right, are forces to be reckoned with. I am thrilled to have James Perry here today. So without further ado, please welcome him. How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And um, you know, Carolyn is a real hero of mine uh, and you know, We've obviously, as she mentioned, served together on the National Fair Housing Alliance board. And there are few people who are as dedicated and as committed as Carolyn. And you know, it's, it's certainly true for me, but I think for many of us on the board that we wish California had 10 more like her uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, the thing that she may not know is that that event in New Orleans uh, where, where she heard me speak was also, I, I think, the first time that I met uh, my wife, Melissa. And, um, and, and I think the thing that she doesn't know was that I was actually protesting Melissa speaking. Um, and I was protesting because Melissa was a, a professor at, uh, at Princeton University at the time, and this was after Hurricane Katrina. And my whole issue was, well, we don't need a Princeton University professor to come talk to us about Hurricane Katrina. We have all these great folks in New Orleans who can tell you about Hurricane Katrina. So I was like, get her out of here, right? So. But then, of course, Melissa shows up and she gives this incredible speech. I'm in the back of the room attempting to protest, but, um, but number one, she's uh, gorgeous. And, and number two, she's brilliant and, uh, and extremely uh, persuasive. And so uh, by the time her speech was done, uh, I wanted to, of course, work with her. And uh, that, as you can tell, evolved. So, <laughs> um, so is everyone comfortable? Good, nice and comfortable? All right. Um, this, this is an interesting day, right? It's uh, 49 years and one day after the assassination of Dr. King. And, and I think that sometimes when people think about fair housing, they forget that we don't honor fair housing month in April just because it's the beginning of the selling season in, in real estate, right? But literally because it is because of the assassination of Dr. King that we get Federal Fair Housing Month, all right? Um, and, you know, I asked you if you were comfortable, but I might suggest that that's somewhat unfortunate if you responded that, yes, you are comfortable. Because in some ways, when we think about the kind of change and progress that America needs and the kind of change and progress that results in uh, civil rights for all people, it's being uncomfortable that gets us there. And when you think about the experiences of Dr. King, there are certainly many uncomfortable experiences. Uh, Dr. King was assaulted hundreds of times. 
He was trolled. You know, you think about internet trolling, right? Well, for Dr. King, he was trolled by the FBI and by J. Edgar Hoover, who constantly pushed him to commit suicide as they uh, threatened him. Dr. King was uh, assaulted. Uh, he was arrested uh, more than 30 times. Uh, at one point in 1958, and this is the, the, the image in the top left corner, uh, Dr. King was stabbed in the chest with a seven inch blade. And that blade rested in his chest right under his aorta. And the doctors told him that if he had sneezed, uh, then that would have been the end. Uh, but of course, it wasn't the end and he had 10 more years of life. So it, it was an uncomfortable life. And of course, an assassination uh, 49 years and one day ago was certainly uncomfortable. And it wasn't uncomfortable just for Dr. King, but it was uncomfortable for his family. Right? We think about the idea that there were constant threats on his family's life, there were bomb threats, his actual home was bombed. Uh, a little known fact is that Dr. King's mother was assassinated. A lot of people don't, don't know that. When you read the newspaper reports about it, it doesn't even mention her name. It says, Negro woman shot. But what happens is on a Sunday morning in church, she's playing the organ and someone shows up with a gun and murders her in church while she's playing the organ. 1974, six years after King's assassination. It was uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable. When we think about the role that real estate and that housing plays in our communities, uh, I don't think we think of it through this lens of a process that is uncomfortable. But of course, the only way we get the Federal Fair Housing Act is that uh, seven days after Dr. King's assassination, the nation is so uncomfortable that Lyndon Johnson pushes Congress to pass the Federal Fair Housing Act in Dr. King's honor. It's being uncomfortable that causes progress oftentimes. So I want to urge this audience to be uncomfortable with me for a moment. So I've already shown you some images that might have been uncomfortable, but I'm going to show you another image that is extremely uncomfortable. So this is a, a warning about the image that's about to come up. All right, it's an, a very uncomfortable image, but it's for a very important point. This is an American lynching. Uh, a lot of times when people think about lynchings, they assume that lynchings happened during slavery, but they didn't. Right? Because slaves were property. It wasn't profitable to lynch or kill your slaves. Of course, people were extreme, extremely uh, unkind to slaves, extremely mean, frankly, but they didn't lynch their slaves. Right? Um, in fact, the American lynching movement towards uh, African Americans happens after slavery. One of the interesting points about this image is that everyone that you can see in this image is a citizen. Right? No one is a slave. In fact, everyone is a citizen. But there's something else that's really interesting, I think, about this image. Can someone tell me what it is? There are a lot of things, but one other thing that, that always stands out to me every time I see it. That's right. It's, people are gathering like it's a social event, and some of them are even smiling for the camera. Right? The people in this image are comfortable, They're extremely comfortable to be there. They're comfortable with what's happened. And they're not worried about the idea that what's happened to a citizen is illegal. This is 1930, when it's definitely illegal in Indiana to murder a citizen. But they're not worried. If you Look at images of lynchings you can find over and over again, images of people smiling, having a good time, laughing, and enjoying themselves. Um, again, I submit that becoming comfortable is not always a good thing for society or for a community. Discomfort is important for our progress. Um, so 
thinking about this idea that discomfort is important for our progress, what do these two people have in common? First of all, do you know who they are? We need, so, we, we need at least probably a millennial or s someone to tell us who one of them is, right? Taylor Swift, right? And who's the other guy? Who's the guy? George, George Bush, right? So what do they have in common? <laughs> other than the fact that they are the, of the same race, what, what else do they have in, in common? Rich, famous, right, all right. We're, we're a good number of years away from it now, but they have this guy in common. They were both upstaged by Kanye West, right? <laughs> so Kanye West ran on stage at the 2009 MTV Awards and said that Taylor Swift didn't deserve her award because Beyonce's album was better, right? And even now, Taylor Swift and Kanye West have beef, right? So, but for uh, Kanye West and George W. Bush, it was interesting in a different way because they also had beef. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I think at the end of, uh, of George Bush's presidency, um, George Bush is doing an interview with Matt Lauer on the, on the Today Show. And Matt Lauer asks him, he says, uh, well, you know, what was the low point of your presidency, All right? And, you know, so folks are sitting there and they're watching and they're like, oh, he's going to say it was Abu Ghraib, he's going to say it was, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, war in Iraq without, you know, any discovery of, of um, WMDs, he's going to, you know, what's he going to say? But actually what he says is, well, it was when Kanye West said I was racist and I didn't care about black people which is pretty amazing. You think about all the different things that, that someone has to fight through and deal with as, as President of the United States, all the major issues. And, and the thing that comes to mind, certainly there were more things, and, he, and the President clarified later, but, but the thing that came to mind for him at that moment was the idea that someone stood on television and said that when it came to Hurricane Katrina, his response indicated that he did not care about black people. All right. What that says to me, and I think the, the, one of the interesting points is, um, it's a few things. The first is, it means that we've come a long way for, um, since that, that image of, uh, of an American lynching, where people certainly were quite comfortable with their views on, on race and the idea that, that racism um, was not a big deal. But, uh, but second is that, that there is some importance to this discomfort on, on race, right? And, and that um, it, we are at a point, I hope we're still at that point, it seems like sometimes um, things are a little different, but it seems like we're at a point where, where racism uh, is not something to be proud of, right? Which is very different from how things were. You know, I, I hear people who are, particularly my wife's students, they'll come and they'll say, oh, nothing has changed. Racism is the same, it's terrible, it's bad, it's horrible, and it's the same as it always has been. But that's not true, right? It's, it's not as bad as it has always been, because certainly lynching doesn't happen anymore, certainly slavery doesn't happen anymore, certainly we don't have laws on the book, books that, that say explicitly that discrimination is allowed, right? So there's been some progress. Um, but I think perhaps the issue might be one of, of awareness. Right. So I'm going to show you guys a video to, to help make this point. Um, and uh, in this video, you're going to see some folks uh, with a basketball. They're going to be passing the basketball around. All right. And I'm going to ask you to follow the instructions here. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. So really focus in on anyone wearing white and count how many times they pass the ball. So how many did you count? 
17, 15, 16, how many? So, so how many of you saw 16? Hands up. How many of you saw 16? Let's go back. How many of you saw 16? How many saw 17? How many saw 18? How many saw 19? 20? All right. So let me ask you this question. How many of you saw the gorilla? All right. A good number. How many of you, so some of you are looking at me like, what? A gorilla? All right. So someone laughed, and when they laughed, that might have, have, have let folks know what was going on. So this time, look at the folks who are wearing black. And I promise this is the same video. So if, if I prime you and, and tell you to focus in on the folks wearing white, then somehow, even though a gorilla walks through the middle of the room, you won't see it. It's pretty amazing, right? And, and when they sh do this test over and over again, and people see it for the very first time, um, 70 to 80% of people never see the gorilla in the room the first time that they watch it, right? And, and it's, it's this trick that your brain plays on you where if, I, if, if you're primed, if you're taught, if, you are, if it's suggested to you that you should look for a particular thing, then that's what you're going to see, right? Even though something else is, that is, frankly, disturbing is right in front of your eyes, right? I think it's pretty amazing the way that the American, the American that the human brain works. And... Um, it's also interesting, though, if you think about that concept and you apply it to, um, to housing and to race in America, right? In that there's this way in which we also have inattentional blindness around race. So uh, how many of you remember, this was about a year or two ago, um, this was an issue involving a gorilla uh, named Harambe at the Cincinnati Zoo. Do you remember that issue, that incident? All right, so, so now this was an incident where a three-year-old boy climbed into the enclosure at the zoo and was uh, held captive by the, uh, by the gorilla, and ultimately the keepers at the zoo felt like they had no choice but to kill the gorilla. And it turned into a huge, huge issue, right? A national story uh, where folks went after the child's mother, they went after the child's father. They wanted to press charges against them over the death of the gorilla. Uh, they brought up the father's uh, criminal record, despite the fact that he wasn't actually there, right? He wasn't even there on, that, on the day. And, um, and, and they did everything that they could to try to get the child taken away from the mother, right? And it was a, a huge issue. People were extremely concerned about Harambe and felt like it was unfair that Harambe should suffer and should die because of the mistakes of, of that family. Right. Now, what was interesting was that that was an African-American family. Right. Only a few months later, there was an incident that was pretty similar. It was at Disney. And this was an incident involving a alligator. Right. And in that incident, a two-year-old boy was swimming in a lagoon that was known to have alligators. It had a sign that said, um, don't swim here, there are alligators. <laughs> All right. and, um, and he was swimming, his family was allowing him to swim, and um, an alligator got him, and, um, and he was killed by the alligator. So Disney killed not just that alligator, but all the alligators. Every alligator there, right? And um, matter of fact, if you go to, to Orlando now, they're just like taking alligators out. Don't even wear it like an alligator outfit or alligator t-shirt, nothing, all right? But I'll tell you what, there were no cries about going after that family, about, you know, for letting the child swim in the lagoon. You know, there, 
despite the fact that there was a sign that said, don't swim here because there are alligators in the water. Um, you know, no one tried to, to go after that family, N nothing, right? And, and so now, don't get me wrong, because I like Harambe too, right? But there, was, there is this interesting way and this interesting lens through which we can see a set of facts that are very similar, but depending upon who's involved in those facts, uh, the media can portray them in a very different light. And so it does bring up, up this issue of awareness and about whether or not we are consistently aware and are using an appropriate lens in all the issues that we're dealing with. So, let's see. Try to go to another slide here. So, there may be some value in combining these two concepts of discomfort and awareness. Uh, and it may be true that those two things can provide action. When you think about the civil rights movement, and you think about the work of Dr. King, in many ways, it was about making things extremely uncomfortable for people. Not just for himself, but more importantly, for, for anyone who was watching, anyone who was paying attention. Right? Um, it was the moment when people turned on the television and saw children being attacked by police officers and by dogs that, that people in general around America began to shift their views around the civil rights movement because they were uncomfortable with the tactics being used on children. Right? Being uncomfortable can accomplish a lot. So uh, John is a, is a good friend of mine and um, it was great to hear him talk because I had a whole bunch of slides and he, he made it easier for me to condense a bit of what I had to talk about into fewer slides. He talked an awful lot about the racial wealth gap. And, um, and, and I think many of you already know why it's so important, right? And this community is a great example of that. Uh, how many of you know about this health goal in Marin County, right? The idea that at one point, so, so can, can you say something about that? So not, that's, I'm sure that's true, but that's not quite what I was talking about. <laughs> um, the, what I've read is that Marin is, at one point, was the most healthy county in Carolina. And it's, I'm sorry, in uh, California, right? And now, and now Marin is second, right? Yeah, it, still not bad, right? Still pretty good, all right? Now, interestingly enough, it's it's also a pretty wealthy community, right? As compared to other communities in the nation. In 2009, it was the uh, 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 Marin had the fifth highest uh, income per capita. Right? So it helps to make the point of this connection between uh, income, wealth, and health, right? without me having to go too far. But of course, this racial wealth gap is pretty persistent and pretty concerning. Right? Uh, for white Americans in 2012, $110,000 was the uh, median wealth. Uh, while at the low end, uh, for African Americans, it was $4,955. So here's the question for you. If we want to bridge this racial wealth gap, what do you think is the best way to go about doing it? How do you fix that problem? So I heard jobs, I heard education. Yes, ma'am. All right, so, so I'm gonna, so, so, so you said a lot of things. You talked about slavery, you talked about, um, about uh, wealth stripping, you talked about, um, about the prison industrial complex, right? So I'm gonna talk, say, uh, negative policies inflicted on, on the African American community to combine all those things. So we heard jobs, we heard education, and then we heard overall negative policies, right? And the splitting up of the family, all right? All right, so. So let's, let's think about those concepts and, and think, think about this idea that perhaps if we could fix 
some of those concepts that maybe we could bridge the, wealth, uh, the racial wealth gap. So this shows the wealth gap by educational attainment. So what you see here is that if you are a white American who's had some college, then your wealth is still at $79,600. If you're a black American who's had some college, then you're at $1,100. And if you're a Latino who's, and you've had some college, then you're at 20,500. But if you're white and you have, had, have not finished high school, then your, your wealth is still likely around $18,800, right? So on this idea that maybe it's education that bridges the wealth gap, what this chart suggests is that even with um, comparable education experiences, or, or even if, when you think about white families or white people who have a lower educational experience than, than black or Latino families, white families still have greater wealth than black families and almost as, as much wealth as Latino families. It's pretty amazing, right? And so the suggestion here, and, and there's more data to support this, is that education, no matter how much you get, may not and probably won't bridge the wealth gap. Now, that doesn't mean to tell your kids don't go to college, right? They should still go to college, but don't go because you think it's going to bridge the wealth gap. So what about work? Hmm. So if, if you're white and you're working and you're working full time, your median wealth is probably is around eight, 82,400. If you're black, it's 10,800. If you're Latino, it's 15,300. If you're working part time and you're white, then you're at, what's, what's that, 9,200 and 2,500 if you're black and looks like about, what, 4,500 if you're Latino, I can barely see from here. But so, Comparable work experience, and you know, there's a there's some more data behind this, whereby if you if if you streamline to make sure that the work experience and the type of work and the income is comparable, and then you compare the wealth gap, then does it bridge the gap? And unfortunately, what it shows is that the gap still persists. Hmm. So so we said education and we said work, right? And and this data suggests that neither one of those will bridge. The the, the wealth gap. <laughs> Fair housing conference, this guy uh, gets it, right? So, but I, I'll still show you the third slide, right? Which is, um, to the point of the way that families have changed, right? So, two-parent household, because you always hear that argument, oh, well, it's the, the change of the family structure, you know, single, single parent headed households. Well, it's still true that if you have a two parent head of household and, um, and it's a, a white family, then it's $161,000 worth of wealth, $16,000 for a black family, and $18,000 for a Latino family. And then the gap still persists for single parents with children, right? Somehow, the gap doesn't change based on a change in your, uh, in your family status or in your, your, your partnership status, right? So you're right. It is housing, right? The one thing that starts to bridge the gap, and it still doesn't completely bridge it, but starts to bridge it by about 30 to $40,000 is home ownership. It plays the biggest role in bri bridging the, the wealth gap. And do you know why? Because it's the, the, the home is the biggest asset, the biggest financial asset that most people ever own in their lives, right? It's the biggest single asset that you own. So what's the problem then, right? So why not just get to work on making sure that everybody has the same access to housing opportunity, right? Because that's our goal, right? That's the whole point of the fair, of fair housing, the fair housing movement. The, that's why you guys are here at this conference. And, and John talked about the momentum of fair housing advocates over the last eight years, right? The problem is the historical starting point. 
it's the biggest challenge. Right? So let's think about it through a historical lens. Let's think, think about this idea that, of course, um, America is this extremely interesting project in capitalism where from the very beginning, even before uh, America was, uh, was declared a nation and had formal government, people could own and transfer property, which was fundamentally different from what happened in Europe, where uh, the king owned everything in whatever country or nation state you were in. Right? But then if you flash forward a little bit further, uh, what happens, of course, is that as white Americans are able to own and transfer wealth, African Americans um, aren't able to own and transfer wealth. In fact, African Americans are property that are being transferred. Right? And it's not until, uh, until slaves become free that there is any opportunity for African Americans to own or transfer property. But this issue persists. Right? Um, and it persists in a few different and important ways. So the first is to think about the way that home ownership works and has worked. Because for the longest time, if you wanted to buy a home, you didn't really go to a bank and buy a home. Instead, you just kind of saved up your money and you either built it yourself or you got with the guy down the street who, who built homes and, and you paid him to do it. But we get to the point in the early 1900s that people start to really get into the process of taking out loans. And then the government gets into the business of supporting this process in the 1930s. And, and the government creates the Federal uh, Housing Administration. The Federal Housing Administration uh, provides insurance that backs loans. And it's at that point that Americans really start this process of, of really uh, buying houses through mortgage lending. And we see this huge expansion where Americans are constantly buying and buying and buying houses. It's the moment that we see the creation of the American suburb. Right? Now, what's interesting about that time is that from 1937 to essentially 1968 or so, uh, that process allowed um, or, was, or, or was set up so that uh, African Americans were essentially barred from getting loans that were backed by the Federal Housing Administration. There was a second type of loan that was also very important during that time, and it was the GI Bill loan. Right? So after World War II, you had uh, veterans coming back, and they qualified for the GI Bill. Uh, and under that bill, they were able to also get a loan and put either nothing or almost nothing down and also buy a home. And again, uh, African Americans, even if they served, were prohibited from partaking in that loan process. At the same time, because these suburbs are, are blossoming, uh, Robert Moses begins this process of creating uh, American interstates that connect cities to the suburbs and really begins destroying urban centers. And so you see white Americans moving away from urban centers and moving to the suburbs and buying homes. And buying homes for the first time without having to save and save and save and save and save, but instead just being able to get a loan and buy the house. So over that period, it's about $500 billion that are invested in highways, and it's somewhere between one and a half to three trillion dollars that are invested in, uh, in housing opportunities, uh, almost exclusively for white Americans. So this is from the 1930s through the early 1970s. And during that entire time, right, so this is the, this is the moment when America builds the vast majority of its wealth. That's it, right? And, and if you think about, about this community, and you think about the suburban communities that exist here, uh, the, the vast majority of those communities were, were built during this time, all right? And, and so it, it is during that time that we build this wealth, and, 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 and again, uh, people of color are excluded from the process. So, when we think about the way that America is, number one, segregated, but number two, when we think about the racial wealth gap and we think about the idea that housing is the thing that creates wealth for, for people, and, and you think about this idea that, that suburbs and home ownership that was financed through the government created home ownership opportunities and then therefore wealth for white Americans, but 
explicitly excluded uh, black Americans through policies that said uh, that you could not sell your home to someone who was black or that had racial covenants for the entire neighborhood or uh, w whereby the um, Federal uh, Housing Administration insurance process would, would redline a neighborhood and draw uh, a line around it and say, in this neighborhood, it's, it's too risky because there are too many African-American families in that neighborhood. If you think about that process, then you realize, of course, that this country has invested literally trillions of dollars into creating wealth for white Americans, but then denied that same opportunity to, uh, to African Americans. And, and, and then when you think about uh, people from other communities, a lot of times they were also unable to participate in those processes. Dr. King said that segregation is the adultery of an illicit intercourse between injustice and immorality. Yeah, I know, right? I was, when I saw that quote, I was like, dang, it's on fire. I think he didn't like segregation. Right. So, so you hear fair housing advocates talk about affirmatively furthering fair housing. That's a very nerdy, wonky way of saying that we want to fix that problem, right? This three or so trillion dollar problem, we want to see that problem fixed and resolved. For anyone who works in, in government and you deal with CDBG funding or home funding, and you see this obligation to affirmatively further fair housing, the whole point is, is to use it to repel and to, and to repair the problem that was created previously. But since 1974, it's only been about $140 billion in CDBG funding. It seems like a lot of money, but remember, I said trillions of dollars spent on creating the problem of segregation, trillions. So what does that look like, right? So John, I, I was, it's, it's always great to see uh, John talk. And you know, uh, he, he talked about the St. Bernard case. The organization I ran at the time was the plaintiff in the St. Bernard case. I never get to hear someone else talk about that case and to see how the audience responds to it, because uh, it was an incredible case. But the other thing that John did was he also used these maps that I absolutely love. There's a guy named Dustin Cable from, um, who, who, uh, who created these maps. And what he did is he pulled up census data and he put one dot for every person in America on the dot, right? And, um, and so then he colored the dots based on your race. So the white dots, I'm sorry, the blue dots are for white people, the green dots are for African Americans, the red dots are for Asian Americans, and the orange dots are for Latinos, right? And so, so John put up the same maps, but he, he, didn't, he didn't say to you that that's what the, the, the dots represented and that that's where it came from. So it's dust and cable, and you can pull up any community, right? So I always like to start by showing Detroit, because Detroit just shows this incredibly, incredibly defining line of segregation. It's amazing how segregated Detroit is. And it's really easy, though, for any of us to say, yeah, well, that's Detroit, right? But it's not just Detroit. Look at Chicago. Look at Los Angeles, right? And, it, and if you zero in, it, you can just, just see how much more segregated each one of these communities are. Here's Philadelphia. Right? Extremely segregated. Here's New Orleans. And I'll just say again, uh, the uh, blue dots are white Americans, the green dots are African Americans, the red dots are Asian Americans, and the orange dots are, are Latino Americans. Right, so, so here's San Francisco. I just, I, I keep it up a minute because I presume people know San Francisco. Right. Here's Oakland. And here's Marin. Most of Marin, it's not all of Marin, but it's zeroed in a little bit, right? So, you know, what's, what's interesting about, about Marin um, are a few things. One, you know, that, that, that kind of hold true to, to what I was able to read about, about Marin. One is that, um, that African Americans are concentrated in Marin City, 
that Latinos uh, tend to be uh, in uh, San Rafael and concentrated along the highway, right? Um, and, but, but what you can see is that it is an extremely segregated community. County, right? It's, it's, it is, right? So, so, so that, that's, that's one of the important points that I seek, to, it's two important points that I seek to make here. The first is that segregation is a national problem, a national historic problem. Sometimes people will tell you, oh, well, you know, people just choose to live in different neighborhoods. No, that's not how it happened, right? People actually weren't that segregated before those government policies came into place. The real segregation of America really came into place after those government policies helped to create a segregated America. Here's the other point, though, that's, that's also important, is that although this is something that was created nationally, and it's a national system of segregation, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, those are those other communities. But nope, it is your community as well. It's my community as well, right? So in Marin, you have the same problems and debates that we see in other communities. And it's pretty easy for any of the cases that John talked about to be a case that is a Marin case, right? So don't fool yourselves into thinking for a moment that, oh, well, that's just because New York was that way, or just that's because um, St. Bernard Parish was that way, or it's because uh, Baltimore was that way. No, it, it could be Marin, right? And I don't think that the bureaucrats in this office who work um, for, for the county think of themselves as fair housing advocates, but how you work and how you decide how money is going to be allocated is the most important factor in overcoming these patterns of segregation that persist in our community, in our communities. Uh, because there's not enough money to spend in the CDBG and home fund process, right? But we can spend it in a smart way. And that's what this process of affirmatively furthering fair housing is about. This whole push that, that under the Obama administration was a federal push, and now in this state is a state push to make sure that we have an appropriate tool to make sure that fair housing is, a, is an affirmative effort. It's about undoing segregation that was a process in the making through federal policy for decades and decades and decades by spending trillions and trillions of dollars. Right. So every single one of these issues, and every single time that you see pushback in the community on these local issues, this is all part of this same fight, all part of this same effort. Right. So the, the question really becomes for all of us, what are we going to do? Right? Are we going to stand up and be counted in each one of these moments? Because it's really easy to simply be comfortable. Right? Because these are, are your neighbors, right? You got to live next door to these people. You got to go see them the next day. You got to talk to them tomorrow. You got to see them at the coffee house. And so when you stand up to them and you say, no, we need affordable housing. We need housing opportunities for, for people um, of, of every race, every ethnicity. Uh, we need housing opportunities for, uh, for, for every type of person. Uh, and, and, and they become uncomfortable with that. It becomes your job to fight that fight and to say it's OK to be uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, it's important because it's the only way that we get progress. Thank you very much. So, so although we don't have time for questions now, I will tell you this, that James Perry will be in our last panel. So you have another shot at asking him questions. Um, and what I also want to tell you is that um, we're going to show a really brief 
James has been talking about how we, you know, the, the, the fight against discrimination um, and to right some of these wrongs. And what I want to do is I want to show you a little clip of what it is that fair housing organizations do to fight dis housing discrimination. So, um, Dennis, are we ready to, to queue up? Um, so I want you to see this little.